one of the standard analogies for meditation is that you're going into battle with all the habits of the mind that create suffering. They're called defilements because they darken the mind. As the Buddha once said, the mind is luminous, but these defilements come in. If the mind didn't have some luminosity, it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to develop it. Everything would stay dark. But the mind does have an, a knowing nature. It does has, have the capability of seeing things clearly, both inside and out. But the defilements get in the way. They're like clouds that come and cover up the sun. And so these are the things that we're going into battle with. Fortunately, they're not they're just clouds. If you tried to do battle with clouds, you'd really be up a creek trying to cut through a cloud. You, that's what is there to cut through. But if you take the analogy that you're going into battle, you can start thinking about how, how people wage war, how people get into a fight, a successful fight. The first thing, of course, is learning how to pick your battles. There are a lot of things that you could fight about, but you waste your energy. If you waste your energy on the minor things and on the trivial things, then when the important things come, you're not up for them. This is why we have to focus our energies on one issue, and that issue is why is it the mind creates suffering for itself? Everything we do, we say we're doing for the sake of happiness, for the sake of our well-being. You know, we end up doing things that cause us suffering. Many times we see it very blatantly, right before our eyes, that yes, it is dependent on what we do, and yet we seem compelled to do it. This is the important issue. If you can take care of this issue, if you choose to focus simply on this battle, all the other issues are going to get resolved. So the first step in any battle is to find a good stronghold, a place where you are secure, where you have the advantage over the enemy. This is why we practice concentration. This is why we develop mindfulness of the, of the present moment. This is going to be your stronghold, because you want to create a place here in the present that's comfortable, where you feel at ease, where you feel secure, where you feel solid. So you work on that first, staying with the breath, and just keep reminding yourself not to get entangled in any other issues right now, as best you can. If other issues do come up, Fend them off just to the extent you need in order to create a space so you can get back to the breath. A sense of ease, a sense of well-being with the breath. So the breath feels full as you breathe in, full as you breathe out. You're not squeezing out the energy of the body as you breathe out. You're not building up tension as you breathe in. Allow the breath to come in and out with a sense of fullness that you can maintain, both through the in-breath and through the out. And then let that sense of fullness spread through the body. That's your stronghold. And then you want to practice being able to stay here in all situations, because you're going to need your stronghold in all situations. There are times when you venture out to do battle with the enemy and you realize that you're, the enemy is more than you thought it was. So you'd be at a strategic retreat. So you need a good place to retreat to, a place you can come back no matter what the situation. So try to try your best to get familiar with this spot where the breath feels comfortable in the body, the mind feels at ease with the breath. And then it's from this position that you can do your work of insight. The qualities of insight, discernment, wisdom, these are compared to your sword. They cut through. 
all the confusion. To cut through all the connections that keep those defilements together, to keep them strong. Because as you get to know the movements of your mind, you begin to see there are lots of little events in the mind that you tie together. You connect this one with that one, that one with this one, and all of a sudden you've got this huge enemy. The narratives that you tell that connect this event with that feeling and that feeling with that event, and then it becomes a huge web by which you catch yourself. So you've got to learn how to cut through that web. And the nature of insight, as the Buddha said, has been seeing things in five ways, or understanding five things about whatever the defilement is, whatever that story is. One, learn how simply to watch it arise. And then a second step is to watch it pass away. You see, learn to see these things as simply as events that come and go in the mind. That helps give you some distance from them. In other words, when a thought world, when a story world comes up in your mind, you don't jump into the world. You look at it as an outsider. The same as if you're driving along the road and you go past a drive-in theater and you see a, a film up on the, on the screen. If you allow yourself to get sucked into the idea that there's actually a story being portrayed up there, you can drive off the road. But if you simply see it as lights moving up on the screen, then you don't get sucked in. And that helps to dismantle a lot of the reality that you give to the film, in the same way with the mind. We give all kinds of trust and reality to the thought constructs that come up in the mind, but if you learn to see them simply as events, little firings of the synapses. It helps cut, to cut through a lot of the, the compulsion we feel about getting involved in that storyline all over again. When you can pull yourself out of that thought world, then you begin, begin to see the construction that goes into it. In particular, you want to see two things about the way it's constructed. One is what gratification you get out of that thought world. Even though it may be causing you suffering, there must be some pleasure, some gratification you get out of it. Otherwise, you wouldn't indulge in it. It would hold no attraction at all. So learn to look to see where that gratification is. And then look for the drawbacks. If you stick with that thought world, what is it going to do? Where does it lead you? Some of the drawbacks you'll see immediately with a sense of tension, a sense of dis-ease that arises, both mentally and physically, as you get involved in that thought world. Some of the drawbacks have to come, will come later. So you've got to learn to look for both. Then the most difficult part is to learn to see the escape from that thought world, from that pattern, from that habit. Sometimes just looking at the arising and passing away of the thought world is enough to undercut any sense of reality or trustworthiness in the thought world, and it'll go away. The other thought worlds are, thought worlds are more compelling. We have to look at very carefully to see the gratification, to see the drawbacks. And you have to use your imagination to find the escape. It's not just a passive process of watching arising and passing away. You have to see where in the mind is that little voice that says, you've got to go back and think that over again. You've got to think about it this way. and You've got to believe in this narrative about that thought world, and that you can't do it any other way. There will be that voice. That's why it's called a compulsion. So many of our compulsions are due to the fact that we can't imagine any other way of reacting to a particular memory or a particular idea. 
And so you have to sit down and very consciously try to think of other ways of reacting. One compulsion is that you, part of you says you've got to get upset whenever this memory comes back. If you don't get upset, you're just being a milk toast. People are getting, walking, going to walk all over you. Put a question mark. And then check to see what other voices come up. And put, learn how to put question marks next to them. Simply the fact of questioning it reminds you that there is an alternative. Then ask yourself, one, is that true? Secondly, what if the opposite were true? And just that much can be enough to jolt your imagination to think in other ways, to get out of the rut of that particular defilement, whether it's greed, anger, delusion. Lust, fear, pride, jealousy, whatever. Learning how to cut through it requires, requires a knowledge that has these five aspects. Seeing it arising, seeing it passing away. Seeing its gratification, seeing its drawbacks, and then seeing the escape from it. your sword can cut in all five directions in this way, then you can really cut through these things. And you begin to see the potential that the meditation has, that it really does free you from the mind's old habits of creating suffering for itself, even though you keep telling yourself, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, because I want to be happy. You have to do things this way in order for happiness to be found, and yet turning up with unhappiness as a result. There's, there's a misconnection in there that you've got to learn how to cut through, and it's this five-fold knowledge that allows you to cut it. So these are your basic tools, your basic weapons. On the one hand, you need a stronghold, you need a safe place to which to launch your attack. That's what the concentration is for. And then you have to learn how to look at the events of the mind from these five angles. That's your sword. This way you take on the really essential battle in life, which is to free yourself from suffering. And these are the tools you need to win. It's all very basic, but so many times in life we miss out on the good things that we can gain because we overlook the basics. It's learned how to appreciate them, because they're the things that can really help you. <laughs>